Rotarians and guests, uh, probably one of the most significant decisions that's going to be made in our state and for our future is going to come from the nuclear waste disposal question, uh, a process which is in ongoing at the moment. Uh, it doesn't need me to make a lot of introduction to our guest speaker, Kevin, Honourable Kevin Scarce. He is clearly a South Australian who's contributed an enormous amount uh, and uh, w has been an honorary member of our club, attended many of our functions, and importantly, what he has contributed to South Australia, if you look at it, uh, he's opened up through in his role as a governor uh, many opportunities for business. Uh, he's certainly in the defence industries. We would owe a lot to the involvement of Kevin in that area. And he's now moved on in retirement. It doesn't seem much of a retirement to me, Kevin. You're working pretty hard. Uh, to where he's Chancellor of the University of Adelaide and having an enormous impact there. Uh, very demanding role. But today he's going to talk about his role as in the Royal Commission Commissioner on South Australia's future with nuclear waste and uh, I think this is probably one of the most important sessions we would have had at this club about our future in South Australia. Please welcome Kevin Scarce. Well, thank you very much for attending. I hope the, uh, the weather isn't uh, <clears throat> a portent of things to come for the subject we're about to discuss. Um, I guess the first question is why? Why have we looked at nuclear activity? Well, for our state, it's one of the areas that we've got a comparative advantage. Australia has 30% of the world's supply of uranium and South Australia has 80% of Australia's known uranium resources. So the question that we were asked to answer was, can we drive greater value by participating in a range of nuclear activities beyond what we already do, which is to mine and mill uranium? Either. So the four questions we were asked were, should we expand mining? Should we become involved in converting yellow cake into a fuel source through conversion, enrichment and fuel fabrication? Should we generate electricity from that fuel source that uh, we would build? And can we manage and store waste? Let me uh, skip through it because I want to give time for questions. The first question is mining. Well, we've been mining for 15 years. Generally, we produce between four and 5,000 tonnes. Uh, the value is about four to five hundred million dollars. Since Fukushima, the demand for uranium has reduced and so has the price. But if we look to the future, the geologists say that we could expect another uranium find of the magnitude between the Olympic Dam reserves and those reserves at Carapatina. So there is a significant opportunity for more uranium to be found in this environment where there's not much money to be made out of uranium, it's clearly not going to happen now. But if we streamlined some of the procedures, there'd be a good opportunity for the state to expand its uranium mining. But even if we doubled the price and doubled the quantity, uh, that would be about $800 million a year. So whilst important, it is not significant. The second part of the process is taking the yellow cake and converting that into a nuclear fuel rod through conversion, enrichment and fuel fabrication. The benefits of these processes are the rich technologies that are used. It's mostly a chemical process. It's something that we're familiar with in Australia. Um, However, since Fukushima, the demand for these um, uranium uh, nuclear fuel rods has reduced, and so we found that the international demand is being oversupplied by about 20% excess capacity. 
So at this particular time, it doesn't make business sense to become involved in these three steps. But if uranium demand <clears throat> does increase and some of the old national sites are very old, this would be an opportunity and we would get a comparative advantage because the, the source of uranium is very close to where we might convert it or enrich it. But at this particular time, it doesn't make any business sense to participate in that. The third area that we were asked to look at was the generation of electricity. Now, climate change is the big unknown in this particular question. We know from the evidence, which is to me overwhelming, that by 2050 we have to be at zero emissions for electricity generation to keep within two degrees of pre-industrial pre limits. We are already in excess of a degree. And when we talk about being two degrees, in Australia that means on the landmass something between three to four and a half degrees. And that starts to impact enormously on the full bowl. So what is going to replace fossil fuels by 2050? I hope that it is a big mix of renewables and other new technologies, but I have to say that there is no evidence that we found that at scale, at price, there is something to replace coal and gas. Clearly nuclear would be a clean, uh, in terms of emissions, uh, opportunity to do that. Um, it all rather depends on how quickly the world reacts to keep emissions to that zero level for electricity generation by 2050. But nuclear is clearly an option. In South Australia, with demand decreasing and an increasing supply of renewables, it doesn't make economic sense to have a gigawatt of nuclear power in the state. And therefore, we saw no opportunity immediately uh, to create um, a nuclear power plant here. There are things called small modular reactors and they put about two to 300 uh, megawatts. That makes much more sense for Austra South Australia's electricity demand, but there's no um, commercial application at this particular stage, but that's something we might look at into the future. So, on a more positive note, what about the storage of spent fuel? At the moment, there's about uh, 300,000 tonnes of spent fuel around the world, and probably half of that hasn't got a solution yet. The first thing that you would think about is safety. It's always first up to think about safety, but I need to explain what we had modelled, because this facility doesn't exist anywhere in the world. So you can see, hopefully behind me, the modelling we asked was, let's create a standalone port. And it doesn't have to be standalone, because you can see throughout the world that ports are used in multifaceted ways. But in terms of conservatism, we said, Let's build a port, let's build an interim storage facility. An interim storage facility is a massive, great concrete pad where you put uh, in 120 tonne containers spent fuel. The purpose that we would need an interim storage facility is to aggregate the cash you need to build the deep underground storage. On my, uh, the bottom scale here, you can see the concept which is at the moment uh, being pretty much recognised around the world as the safest way to store spent fuel. You go down about uh, four to five hundred metres, you build a series of caverns, you encapsulate the spent fuel depending on your geology, but in Finland for instance it's encapsulated 
in uh, five centimetres of uh, welded copper and you put it in bentonite clay and then you close the whole of the facility up with bentonite clay. And you then have to prove to a regulator over a series of tests that uh, this facility will hold uh, radionuclides for up to four to 500,000 years. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. So between the interim storage site and the deep geological storage, um, a railway line, security, uh, it's probably a 25 to 30 year building program, anything between four and 5,000 people employed at its peak, and then around a couple of hundred uh, throughout its life, as well as all of the activities of building the canisters, building the casks, building the ships. There's a lot of ancillary activity involved with this, which I didn't model, um, which would create jobs and wealth and opportunity to the state. But let me talk about the most important thing, which is not a blank screen. which is the radiotoxicity. So what happens when a spent nuclear fuel rod comes out of the reactor? It generally goes into a pool for up to 10 years to control its temperature. It then comes out of the pool and goes into a pretty sizable uh, steel and concrete uh, container, about 120 tonnes, and it's left on a concrete pad for up to 50 to 60 years. So by the time that you're ready to put it underground, you can see the reduction in the radiotoxicity. Teddy, hopefully. So it comes, comes out of the reactor. First 10 years, it's in a pool and what we've got left, because it's decaying, is about 30% of its radiotoxicity. By the time it's ready to be stored in 50 to 60, 70 years, it's down to about 15%. Now, it is still toxic. Despite the fact that the uranium is decaying, there is plutonium and americium in there, small quantities, but very toxic, and that needs to be controlled. The important time period is up to 1,000 to 10,000 years. At 10,000 years, it's about 1.5%. It is predominantly americium and plutonium. Underground, they are not soluble, nor are they mobile. And when you put it in bentonite clay, uh, when it breaches the canister, as it will, it uh, aggregates and accumulates uh, in the rock surface uh, around the bentonite clay. So that all sounds fabulous. How do you prove it? Well, the Finns have been at this now for 30 to 40 years, so have the Swedes, and so have the Swiss. And they have an underground laboratory. They are testing the breakage of canisters. You need to model uh, the life of a canister. Uh, the Finns are very confident that their canisters of five centimetres of welded copper will last 10,000 years. And when that eventually is breached, you've got probably one to one and a half percent of the radiotoxicity of the original ore body left. And about 300,000, 100 to 300,000 years it's about the same toxicity as the surrounding um, rock or clay. And they have spent the best part of 10 years now proving uh, to their regulator that even if canisters break, um, the radiotoxicity won't breach the allowable level at the top surface. At the top of the surface, the allowable level is 0.1 of a millisievert. Now, Every day, 
or every year, in Australia, we have background radiation of between one to three millisieverts. So what we're talking about, the allowable limit at the nearest possible connection with human race is 0.1 of a millisievert. So it's quite demanding. I've been down to look at Finland. I've looked at the site. Uh, I don't think the technology is beyond us. We have geologists, hydrogeologists. Um, we understand mining. We understand having run nuclear reactors at uh, Lucas Heights for 60 years. We understand waste. Uh, most of our waste is actually stored in nuclear uh, facility at, at um, Lucas Heights in the middle of Sydney. The question is, does the community support that? That's the process that we're going through now. Um, it's very important to have that discussion with the community. It's not something that can be imposed. What is the benefit? Well, again, we had individually uh, modelled, independently modelled um, this because there is no industry at the moment. We had to make a proxy for the, uh, for the price that we might get for this. I think the proxy I took was a very conservative one and I see some criticism coming out of Finland uh, last week that it was too conservative in terms of cost, I'd, in terms of price, I don't mind that. Um, in terms of pro uh, cost, um, it's about a $40 billion cost and uh, I've certainly added enormous contingencies so that we're not overly optimistic. What's the end result of that? About $257 billion in income and $145 billion in cost. $30 billion is added to the end of the program to look for a mediation. Um, that's an enormous amount based upon what other nations have put aside, but again, I wanted to be conservative. If, as we should, we protect that wealth for future generations and put it in a state wealth fund, over 70 to 80 years, that would grow uh, to around $450 billion. That's assuming that the money is um, invested, that there's a 4% return on that and half of that is reinvested. That would also give the state anywhere between two and six billion dollars to spend every year. I think it's a compelling case to take to the community and the community should decide based upon the evidence. There's lots of emotion and we will never, ever get over that. Uh, but we are not talking about a Chernobyl or a Fukushima. We're talking about something that we understand, but something that will be with us for countless generations, so we can't afford to make a mistake. Questions? Wastage. Once the country that wants to store their wastage with us contacts us, do we have a? Do we then own that product once we bury it? It's ours, and is there a fixed figure currently for how much that is to store the the product? And before you answer that, is it ever going to be worth anything eventually to someone with high okay. technology? Let's take the last question first. Um, if we did this, we would be a world leader. And one of the first things that I think you'd do is set up a way to get benefit out of the waste that you've got, either to resell it or to do something that adds value with it. Now, at the moment, um, there's a view that it can be burnt as future fuel, but that's very expensive. It's much cheaper to just to convert ordinary uranium. The, the first question was about client nations. The transfer of fuel is governed by international regulation. So South Australia will not be able to go alone here. We'll need to have the federal government with us. It would need to be a treaty, you know, I think because of the surety that we would want that if we build this facility, it'll be used, um, and the surety that they'll want that they've got, um, they don't need to worry about waste uh, for life. Your second question is, yes, we would own it. Now, I don't think you would go into this without a pre-commitment. There's too much money involved. 
But I've talked with energy ministers in um, Taiwan and officials in Japan and energy ministers in um, Seoul and Korea. They are interested. They don't have the geology. They don't have the stable geology that we have. They've got seismically active areas. We don't. They've got not too much land. We've got plenty. And they've got a lot of water. And we've got a lot of land without a lot of water. So when you add all those distinctive characteristics up, it's, it's a comparative advantage to us if the community supports it. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I come from a country that <clears throat> doesn't have any resources and um, works on ad adding value to other countries' resources. Um, I, I cannot see why we should not produce, I mean, if we're going to embrace this uh, road, we, I, I reckon we should produce electricity with it. We had somebody just explaining to us that we've closed a, um, a, a production facility in Porta Gasta, I think it is somewhere in the north part have, of the state. Yep. Yep. And the infrastructure allows us now to buy energy from other states. So if we would produce more energy, we could actually send it the other way. So I, you know, I, I think that point of not requiring the production because we don't consume doesn't really stand. I think we should produce it and, and because it's another added value to this process once we embrace it. And my last comment is to get people to embrace it, we need to also give the benefit that this would give to South Australians. So, for example, I'm sure that if we uh, um, broadcast the fact that the next 10, 15 years, South Australia will pay 20% for their electricity bills, we will embrace it. Okay. Why don't we do that? Rather than get the profit that you have described, what's going to happen to that and leave it at a big, high corporate level, it needs to feed back to South Australians. Okay, let's answer the first question. Um, there's no way that nuclear energy can compete with coal. It simply uh, would have to be subsidised by the federal and state governments to an enormous extent. We are eventually going to have to retire that coal. So there is an opportunity for the future, I would agree, for a state, if the interconnectors, and we've got upgrades in the interconnectors at the moment, if the interconnectors are sufficient, then there's an opportunity to, uh, to export electricity. But it's simply not feasible under the current government rules where, at the moment, renewables is incentivised and generation other than renewables is not. In terms of the benefits to South Australians, I agree. Um, there will need to be some benefit to the nation because this will be a national agreement, but the vast majority of the benefits should come to South Australia, and I don't, I couldn't hazard a guess, but in 30 years' time, if we are as we normally are, we've, behind the eight ball, we've done nothing about climate change, uh, we're slow to react, um, there'll be a period where we will simply have to solve the problem. And I haven't seen anything that convinced me uh, that anything other than nuclear could give us the scale of electricity that we want. So. It's not that we've discounted it. The report is pretty clear that we think that's the future, particularly with modern nuclear reactors that can look after themselves without human intervention for three days if they lose power and lose cooling. But it doesn't make economic sense to the state at this time. Thank, thank you. Two questions. In the breakdown product of uranium, and I'm not sure if that's the case, is at one stage, is it a gas in its actual breakdown process and I suppose that's the highest risk time for escaping. The second question is, is the final product of the breakdown lead? Uh, there is some gaseous um, escape, not much, uh, in fact in, almost infinitesimal because when you store it above ground and it's decaying for that 50 years, it's naturally aspirated. So, you know, the air cools it through holes in the ground. But when you put it in the ground because you're Con you're containing it, then there is an additional amount of gas uh, around and the bentonite clay manages that activity. But the end product is, uh, is a cocktail but partially of about 12 or 13 inert um, uh, 
minerals, but with americium and plutonium and a couple of other very small um, transuranics. That is the thing that is a concern for everybody. Uh, it's 500 metres underground, um, and if there's no water, it requires a cataclysmic uh, geological event to get it to the surface. So that's our advantage. But you, you, know, you have to be very careful about that. In South Australia, our back, our backyard hasn't moved for 2.6 billion years. So, you know, there's some form there to think about. Sorry, John. Sorry, John, you're next. Thank you. Mrs. Scarce, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I've got uh, two quick... One is um, the economic arguments are, are really strong. But the thing that concerns uh, me greatly is the emotional issue and the brand issues for South Australia on a global scale. You know, we have a remarkable clean and green reputation. Our wine industry is second to none on the planet. And uh, to, to have the imprimatur of being the nuclear waste dump of the uh, world is not, does not sit very well with that kind of brand imaging. The other point is, and I don't know much about it, but talking to some engineering friends, I understand that there is a process where some of this spent material can actually be reprocessed and actually returned to uh, countries from whence it came. Yeah, the, the first question is, I think France would argue that we are the world's best wine nation, and 56% of France's power comes from nuclear sources. When you travel through Europe, uh, Finland, Sweden, um, France, I, I don't see any impact upon their particular image, their image of their industries or their image of, um, of pop and of tourism. If there's an accident, hell yeah. But remember, that's not what we're about. We're about putting it into the ground. It's not going to be critical. Um, so I think we've got to think through where we put it, you certainly wouldn't put it anywhere near where it jeopardises uh, the very important qualities that we have in our state. Um, but there's plenty of land out there uh, which isn't being used for anything else. I haven't seen it hurt other countries. I think we can manage that. Secondly, you can reprocess um, and... Uh, in a process called vitrification, which you put it in glass and then you store the glass, um, you can convert it into a fuel source, but that's eight times more expensive than taking uranium out of the ground and, and processing it through. So at this stage, the technology is not there uh, to cost-effectively do that. And we've been at it for 50 years. So, last one, I think. So, in view of the fact that there's a lot of opposition that appears to doing this, how foolish are the people of Australia in the middle of Sydney, the middle of Adelaide, where we've got all this waste stored all over the place, could go poof any moment? Um, would you care to comment? Why are we so stupid not building a, a project? Well, can I just say that it, it won't go poof? Um, <laughs> But you're right in terms of if you want it professionally managed, I don't know whether you realise, but in Adelaide there are 80 sites storing, um, 80 sites storing nuclear waste. Now, we've had the benefit of that because it's generally been medical or some sort of research activities. I think we need to stand up for the low-level waste and just get it done. It's, frankly, it's not an engineering miracle by any means. Uh, but I think what we've seen in this process, if you don't engage the public properly, and I don't think they, and I know they didn't, uh, then you get the sort of reaction you, you get. I've seen it work overseas where there have been negotiations with the community, the community gets a benefit, the community's happy. We should be able to do that, really. It's not beyond us. And I think I'm over my time. No, stay here, stay here. I've got to, I've got, I've got to do something. <laughs> Um, I won't embarrass everybody, but um, just for your information, the most important thing for everybody in a community, in response to John's question too, is that we all get involved in 
providing our ideas back to the source. And I, the way of doing that in this community involvement is how many of you have actually gone to the website, which is nuclearusa.sa.gov.au? You probably don't even know about it, which I think is a great issue, uh, but that's where you can find out an enormous amount of information to complement what Kevin has done today, which I think is a real catalyst to our own activities, to get more information so that we can actually have a say in what we should do. That website will be is a government website. It will be in the bulletin so people can follow it up. But please, let's not be apathetic about this. This is the future. And I'd like to sort of say that this future fund that we talk about, which is so important to communities, if you've ever been to Norway and seen the benefit that they get out of their future fund, I, I went walking there two years ago and they built a tunnel, we have difficulty in building tunnels, a four kilometre tunnel through a mountain to a small village of 25 people so that the children could go to school. Think about what money can do, and this state has not got that. Kevin, you've really stimulated some real questions for everybody. I'd really like to think that we as a club and as individuals get involved in trying to feed back and give our ideas, because at the moment, it doesn't seem to me there's a lot of general community feeding information back into the government about a decision that they have to make. Please thank Kevin Scarce for his involvement and I'll give him a token of our appreciation. <laughs>